Welcome to now living arm anatomy. So we're going to look at three different poses and we're going to draw uh, from the deltoid really to the to the wrist area. So there's no probably better place to start uh, drawing and analyzing the human form uh, than Michelangelo. This is one of the Sistine Chapel Ignudi and uh, we're just going to analyze this wonderful bent arm pose kind of resting on this forearm and upper arm and through here and we'll just indicate the hand uh, as well and I'll do a hand uh, lec uh, video later and get close up to the fingers etc. So getting the now the gesture uh, going here I'll pull out a little bit in a moment you'll see that so you can get a clear view of everything just hang on for a second I realized I was a little bit out of the camera and I corrected that. So just getting the feeling of the gesture coming down from the deltoid to the olecranon, there we go, to now the uh, wrist area and then getting the hand over and through. And so now we can adjust and get all of this wonderful anatomy in. So what we'll do here as we're working is to talk about the anatomy that we're drawing but yet not be so diagrammatic with it. Uh, and be more natural, have a natural kind of sketched uh, finish to it. So bringing down now the volume of the complete forms together, all of the, the deltoid, the biceps, the triceps, the olecranon of the humerus down and, and through. You can already feel where the tricep is going to be attached on both sides. Moving through the deltoid and through here as it overlaps everything ultimately and then comes over to the scapula getting a feel for that scapula coming down that big bulge of the teres major there and minor and working the edge now of the bone and bringing the bicep head over So it's putting all of this information to what it was meant to be used for, to draw better, to draw more accurately. Not to forget gesture and volume, which are more important than anatomy, but to now add the last step to our uh, knowledge and to get even more specific and complete with uh, our drawing training and through here. So an egg form now for the flexors and the extensors. Do you know which side the extensors are on and which side the flexors are on? So you can see clearly the ulna from the olecranon or the elbow coming all the way down to the wrist and the side I'm drawing there are the extensors, right? So grouping them together, that big bulk, bulky Michelangelo-esque egg form. So men and women were drawn muscular. There was little subcutaneous fat over the entire model. Very bulky, very big, and, and most of his models were male. And then they were changed to females, especially for the Sistine Chapel. So getting a sense of where the olecranon comes in, the uh, condyles of the lateral and medial, and you can feel where the humerus bulge would come through here and then meet the acromion process of the scapula up there. Now feeling the ulna, see how the ulna at the top attaches to the olecranon through ligament but also has that mouth shape. And so we're seeing the back part of the ulna and then the styloid process down below. That bulkier ulna, what I call the ulna P or the ulna protrusion down below. Attaching on the muscle forms back through, and then the oh, the wrist wants to move in this direction as a block. That line is very important. All that's cylindrical, and ending the extensor forms, and then down below is more bulgy ligament uh, uh, tendon material and then I'm moving the arm over a little bit. I give it more of a, uh, a an angle which is okay. And then the flexors extending and then moving downward and then even below the the forearm is so uh, developed that even the lower part of the forearm has a bulge to it. And then getting the feel of where the sacrospinalis is over there, the pectoral here 
getting a gesture as it moves back up and in, the lats are over there, and then we're going to get a little bit of the rectus abdominis further and moving over, and of course uh, that will start to crash and bulge into one another and come down to the end of the rectus abdominis. Now at the top here, feeling the scapula now, the chromium process, the spine of it, and then the trapezius above it, up in through there, and then of course now we're at the acromion process of the scapula covered by material and skin and through and you can see that bulge with the humeral humerus ball is underneath that but we start to get around this as it's contracted up and through all that's in contraction and then down the deltoid the lateral edge of that and over as it crashes down So the idea here is to find a little, I'm going to draw a little bit more of the deltoid than what Michelangelo is showing just to show the overlap to you see that. But some, you know, a lot of times you won't be able to tell as much where the deltoid ends and where the triceps and the biceps begin. So you've got to know it. You've got to have trained, done your diagrams and all the other work. And then as you start to sketch from reality, live, master studies, etc., you have a better, much greater understanding of where all that is. So that a natural kind of occurring stylistic uh, interpretation of the figure can occur. If you take a look at Michelangelo's painting, the fresco next to us here, it, it's very stylized and simplified, quite, quite a bit simplified. But we immediately know the style Michelangelo. Bulky figures, I would not call him a colorist, it's a very simple palette for the most part, even though the color can be bright once they cleaned it. Now getting back to the anatomy, the triceps bulging coming out and underneath and over the head, the medial, the longer head, right, will be in here and it has a cupping kind of feeling as that larger tendon will, will attach all the way down to the olecranon on top of the ulna. So it has a bowl kind of shape as I'm demonstrating here and then the two long tendons of each head will come down to the outer edge of each condyle. So the axis of thickness of the entire bulky area of the bicep and the tricep is where I indicated that line. I need to do a video on axis and width. It's not necessarily an anatomy thing. This is more of a figure thing. Bulkier head of the bicep now he, 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 it flattens and then it gets bulgy and then it flattens again and then it comes all the way down as it attaches now to the ulna, this particular head. We'll get that in a moment. So this line right there gets comes in and it gets a little straighter right in through there. And then we meet overlapping will be the brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus. So we're already getting a nice shape to that already. Michelangelo makes it easy for us. And look how bulky the forearm is. It's really bulky. Here's the axis, the thickness, the greatest thickness across the form is the axis of width. So I'll go in here and separate a little bit where that tendon of the tricep attaches onto the lateral epicondyle here, you can it's clear as day, right, in through there. Then we get the top part of the ulna and then the bottom part of the humerus, the olecranon area. Right in through there, he makes it pretty clear. So we can be clear with our study of anatomy through Michelangelo's vision, which is a totally acceptable way of analyzing studying. As a matter of fact, that's how he studied and, and learned in generations after him. So the head of the tricep and then the tendon coming down and are coming up, if you will, and then the head, the medial head over, and we'll just make that a rounded ball head. You won't see the, the, the complete medial, the third head of the trice, uh, tricep in this, in this view. As a matter of fact, you rarely see it. It's underneath the other two. Working the electron on here. 
hand over, hand over. Tendon head of the lateral tricep in through here, and you can use the shading in this case, especially to help see the form in its roundness and, and its location as well. And so that bulking head where that core shadow is, where that head bulks, gives us a sense of that form's direction, just like I'm showing there. Normally I would go ahead and tone it down quickly, but a little bit different purpose here. The end of the, the head of the tricep here, and then it comes down nicely into the tendon all the way down to the lateral epicondyle here and then over and attaches in through there. And then the space between, remember it's kind of like the gastrocnemius, but that space between is upon neuroses tendon, the back of the underneath part of your tricep. And it's not very bulky back there, but it's tendinous, tough, fibrous, elastic material. Now getting up here, feeling the acromion process in the scapula coming together and the humeral ball underneath slightly. A little bulge right in through here, the teres minor coming over, bulky. All right, we feel that through in through here in this crease now, the deltoid coming over. Okay, and then we'll feel the scapula now even further. You can see that it's triangular feeling trapezius up here and it'll, it'll get us off the paper. The scapula now more triangular, more greater than 90 degrees at its turn here just slightly in downward. You can see it fits into these feeling of the back and over and downward very softly gently but there it is for you. It comes about halfway down the, the rib cage and back and through. Now we're at the Teres major and minor areas. And the teres major is just glaring at us. It's just, it's it's so obvious that big saucy circular round round form right in through. Let's see if I go underneath. There it is. And right. Come on, keep going, Mark. There it is. There's your teres major attached to the medial side of the scapula. And there it is for, for sure. Really nice and, and bulky right in through there. And then there's that indentation, that fossa, where the infraspinatus sits right above it, where there's a little shadow in through there. And that all has plays a part in the deltoid as well. We really get most more of that into the back, but you can see what's going on there. And it's a greatly more much more simplified painting than his drawings would get very super detailed. It seems like his drawings, like everything was almost flexed. It was so intense. There was just no fat on the model at all. Coming down to the end of the erector spinae muscles, do you remember those? The spinalis, the longissimus, and the iliocostalis muscle. In through there's attaches at the base of the pelvis. So just getting a feeling of the back, but that's enough for that. So we want to make sure that we're back to the upper arm. But it's good to put on some of the other areas so that we can give a geographic location of what we have together here. So deltoid head moving over and that's now you can get the feeling of the form through the shadow pattern so I'm just feeling out the shadow and I'll tone that down a little bit I try not to get well there I go now I try not to go too crazy with shadow we'll get into a lecture on light value edges and contrasts so that tells you how the deltoid is turning but that line I make over the tricep right through there that's where that and that's stronger than what Michelangelo has I know that and I'm just trying to point out there how the deltoid overlaps in anatomy he doesn't show it there to gracefully show smoothness and elegance he did that for a reason Michelangelo was a master at anatomy he he dissected cadavers and he could get a hold of them and, and really under, understand what made our world, what made the human form, give us the surface quality that it, that it does. And here we are today learning from that. Whether you want to be more traditional or, like me, more postmodern with your art, these techniques. If you've been studying the human figure for 
for learning to draw better. That's, that's great. You have no interest in making art that's figurative. It's still a worthwhile pursuit. So now carving out the olecranon, we can see the ulna really standing out. It's almost screaming out at us. Uh, and I make mine a little bit more angled um, just for flow. And I was really concerned to make sure I get it in the page. So you have full rights to change the pose a little bit. If you if you can, you want. Now here's the side of the, the ulna, the thickness of the ulna, where you can see that shadow is. And some you're getting some extensors. The uh, extensor carpi ulnaris would be in that range attached to it. But I give it some contour there with the shadow and the toning. But it's also the side of the bone. It's like a block. Do you see that? The shadow side is the left side going back away from us. And then the lit, lit side is um, kind of showing out in front of us. So there you go. It's a better view of the volumetric quality of what's going on with that bone. But the bone stands out clearly, clearly. It runs, you can see it run all the way down to the styloid process. And then we have the a little bit now of the extensors coming out and the brachy, brachioradialis moving outward, which attaches up to the humerus. And the extensor carpi radialis longus. They really bulk out. I love Michelangelo's forearm studies. He really puts them very bulky so we can see that anatomy cleanly and clearly. I think it's kind of fun to narrate these drawings after I did them. I just didn't have any... I thought it would be nice to like just draw so they could actually could go faster and not talk while I draw for a change. Brachial radialis, then it then it flattens. See how it flattens out there? Then it comes back over a little bit. And we get the extensor carpi radialis longus and then over to the extensor carpi ulnaris area. And he's simplifying that. They don't striate, they don't stand out in this particular pose. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. What's important is to group them together. Know which side you're on. Am I on the extensor side or am I on the flexor side? If you forget, if you don't go back and look at your drawings in your notes or go back and look look at the anatomy section uh, that I've done here so that to help. Now we'll come over to get the flexors. Very pronounced flexors in through here. Ulnaris, flexor carpi ulnaris, and then probably even the, not quite the palmaris, but almost, almost in through there. There's some deeper, deeper muscles that we don't need to, to name. But again, the whole form to start out with was when the egg form in a tube, and then you get to the specifics of the muscle contouring. And then here he gives a little bulky egg uh, shadowing just slightly. Let's go back to the extensor side here. I separate a little bit, a little strong divot right in through there. You can, you can see where he makes the light show there. Turning over. The flexor. And it's a little more bulky as it continues to come down and it starts to straighten out just a little. And this is another sub egg form. The end of the form where it starts to become tendons is so developed that the tendon area is larger and wider. And there's your axis in through there. So we get the straightness here, and then we get another curve. Do you see that curving down? And then on through. So this is a contouring, but we want to see it in conjunction to the volumetric context. So the whole grouping of what? We have extensors to the left. We have the ulna in the middle. And then we have the flexors on the right. And they all make a tube and then they make egg forms in the tube. And then we can separate them into more distinctive muscle groups if we need to, if they show. Otherwise, your finished drawings, if you're drawing for a natural look, will begin to look like uh, anatomical studies. So anatomy can be subsumed and it can be controlled 
and pushed back when we want. Otherwise, we're going to start to draw draw like uh, Paula Yulo. If you haven't, if you don't know his, he's an early Renaissance Italian artist, beautiful draftsman, infatuated by anatomy, and every figure he drew was as if every piece of anatomy was flexed and and moving. We just can't have that. Some muscles have to be relaxed while others are more contracted. Squared off wrist area, the ulna styloid process coming out. The hypothenar muscles make a block in through there. So we're almost got everything we need. Now we can just kind of clean up a little bit. Bring this out, the flexors a little bit further. Well, I won't go into a full value finish. Because it's not important, but we want to be clear with our diagramming or rendering. You can do studies for value. You can do studies for anatomy, which we're doing, and form, which we're doing. You can do studies for gesture. You can do studies for color. There are many different ways to, excuse me, study the model, study the uh, art historical information given by, uh, in this case, Michelangelo, the masters. So there are many different ways to study it, and they all come together in the end. And you learn it so well, you don't really think about it while you're doing it. You just you just draw or you paint, and that's what you want to get to. However long that takes, if it takes five years, ten years, it generally took an apprentice, um, a student, even the geniuses, Raphael, Leonardo. Michelangelo, 10 years, 11 years in, in a guild to come out and train. From 10 years old, they would start at 10, 11, 12 maybe, but that, that early until they, they got their apprenticeship finished and they were a master apprentice or journeyman. And then they moved, moved on. You know, you look at Bernini. My wife was looking at Bernini the other day, and it, it was... Uh, Michelangelo, uh, excuse me, Bernini's David, which is one of my probably my favorite David, and he finished. He made that at 25, and my wife was amazed. And I said, "That's about right for the training that they got." One thing is, they trained early, they trained deeply, but they were very limited into what art was. We go through many different variations now in training because there's so many more art movements to work through. So it's much more difficult to be an art student today than it was in the, the 16th or even the, yeah, the 16th century, maybe the late four, uh, 15th as well. Little flexor, carpi ulnaris coming out, separating it from the, here from the brachioradialis. I mean, we could go deeply into this. We could take quite a bit of time here, but I'm just getting a little bit more separation with a finer pencil using a Conte crayon, a thicker crayon. If you're not comfortable with that, draw what in whatever you're comfortable with. These are just, it's nice to draw, be able to draw bigger so the camera can pick, pick it up a little bit better, that's why. When I draw small, I use a fountain pen. When I draw medium, I use charcoal or I'll use graphite or I'll use uh, uh, polychromous waxy kind of pencils either way. Any of it's fine. Get used to using all of it if you can. Draw small, draw big. Here I'm separating the Flexor carpi ulnaris from the bone, as Michelangelo has showed us to do, as he did these studies from observation. And just getting a little contouring around and through and working the tendon down. So we're pretty, pretty much there. I'll take a little darker area and just indicate the tendon across the bone there, the brachioradialis that it overlaps the bicep there. And just filling in these really strong little spots of the head now, excuse me, of the tendon of the lateral tricep, tricep head moving. And we could contour out this all day, just a few more, a few more minutes here. We'll go on to the next little turn of the tricep in through there. And we'll tone this back 
so you can see this a little further. This is not quite as round, it's a little bit more oval shaped. That acromion process through here, a little bit more oval. Right in through there. There's a little overlap too at the top of the acromion process on the left side. I hope I get that. If not, that's okay. Sometimes you do a drawing and then you 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 step back and you look at it, you know, a day or two. You're like, oops, I need to define that area. That's very common. Back through the trapezius and over downward as it cascades into the spinal area and through there. Just feeling these, teasing these out a little bit further. Michelangelo gives us just enough to subdue that and through here and around, a turning around and through. Core shadow a little bit stronger here. And I think that's enough. All right, I think we're ready to go on to the next. Okay, here we go. Now we have a nice view from a model here with an extended uh, hand or right hand and we get a good feel for the delta. So let's work the the composition, let the camera get in focus. Sometimes it, it uh, goes out of focus. And here we are. So we'll get the feeling of the contour of the deltoid. Keep it line. I'm using a Conte stick here. Getting a feel of the pectorals, it attaches underneath and then the overall gesture. The gesture can feel like the bone. It can be the bone or it could be just movement. So I don't necessarily make it the bone always, but it, in this case it feels like it. So the gesture, the movement of now the bicep coming down to the flexors and the extensors, know which ones they are. So the top of the hand here are the extensors, the bottom area around are flexors and they're in a little bit of a of a turn and then we'll just indicate a little bit where the hand is going to be out to the wrist. The bones there are just going to give a wedge to the top and over and through and get comfortable now feeling our way through the gesture of it. Some artists take longer with gesture, others take a little bit less time. Depends on, a little bit of that depends on your style, depends on what you want. Um, confidence level maybe sometimes too as well and also knowledge level you try you you know depending on your expression you you if you're working from a very kind of traditional point of view you want to keep your gesture very light very clean so that the forms uh, later on the volumes etc anatomy can go on top but if you're working if you're a German expressionist you might it might be all about wild beautiful, expressive, aggressive, angular line, etc. So there are many different ways. You just have to know what you're going for. Make sure that you know that. And I love all that. Right now we're just, it's just, this is about control, a lot of control and anatomy understanding. So now feeling out the deltoid as it attaches over to the lateral part of the clavicle up here. You can see the divot it kind of gets at that right part of the deltoid and comes down. And that's going to go to the deltoid pro, uh, tubercle and through there and disappear. So it's roughly in through here. And then we get the lateral edge of the deltoid to the interior part right in through there. Not all that is stretched, or not a stretch, but mostly attached, obviously, to the, the lateral third now of the clavicle, as we've already demonstrated. This is has a shape that's kind of blocky in through there, and then we get this sort of blocky rounded part coming through and over. There we go. Pectoral coming over and through. So continuing on now, I'm just feeling where that deltoid squares off here, and then feeling that little divot where the clavicle would be right up and through here and then go down to the rib cage. Moving through there and curving around his neck and then meeting up with the sternocleidomastoid muscle right in through that little curved divot right in through there. 
and then we get a little bit more of the bulky head of the bicep. That all curls around like so, and then pulls around to the lateral and then to the posterior part of that area. And of course the pectoral meets up with that, and it's ultimately going to pectoral, uh, pectoralis major is going to uh, attach up underneath to the greater tubercle area, the crest of that over and through there. So remember that deltoid comes over. It can be hard to tell at times, but we've got to make sure that the deltoid. And then you get a little bit more of the interior head kind of show just a little bit more through, through there. I'm making a little bit more of a point of that. As it comes through, a little bit of shading and tone will show that's a little bit more of a box there, and then of course it rounds out. The deltoid can be very boxy depending upon the point of view, and then it can get round um, too as well. And you never really see the greater three heads unless you have a bodybuilder type, a very strenuous exercise going on up and through. So now the bicep brachii underneath there. So we feel the tuberosity of the body of the humerus a little bit right in through here. Of course, it'd be a little bit lower now as it comes down and then the, then the uh, olecranon front part of that actually would be right ultimately in through here to feel that through. Now the brachialis is on underneath all that, but getting a little divot feel for there underneath the brachioradialis would be and then the bicep brachii heads. Now we can start to feel them come through and on in. And they'll tuck underneath the pectoralis major and then the deltoid break. So we can get really clear about what we're doing anatomically here. And then we can see the, the bicep brachii come underneath. And we feel that tube over. And that's on the other side, a little bit of the triceps, not the bicep right in through here, bicep brachii. And right in there, with it, is that right there where the bicep brachii ends a little bit, the two heads. So we're gonna see the head split apart just a little bit where that sort of mid-tone is, not the darker shadow, but the mid-tone is uh, in the, uh, the reference photo. So the deltoid head and then a little bit of the tendon coming down, which is covered over on top by one of one of the veins or arteries. I don't know which. I generally don't teach those. It's not important for us. When once you see it on the surface, veins or arteries are tubes carrying blood either to or from the heart. And then we have the uh, the condyle epicondyle here, medial, which is more of the ulna tricep, which will disappear behind the brachioradialis, which starts to make an appearance right. And through that turns around like a tube. And then we get this bicep now splitting a little bit further. Tendon there of the brachii, uh, biceps brachii. Right in through there, it's bulkier. We'll go to the radius lateral side in this view. Turning, turning a little bit as we know the classic look of the biceps brachii. And just finishing out the pectoral as it's foreshortened and then moving down then off, off the page of our image there. So once you get these under your belt, they're really stretching over now and attaching and going underneath, it starts to become easier once you put all this together. The, the point is to practice this, start to memorize it by doing. Remember the forms, shapes in the forms. So now we're moving, we get a little bit of a turn now, a little pronation here, and feeling the flexors there, and that cavity that's made a little bit by the brachioradialis turning. You have that kind of classic V-shape. Now I know that that vein is there. I'm not going to draw the vein in this in this drawing. So the brachioradialis overlaps the tricep, and then we get the larger part of it together. Now it's the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longest too. It's really tube-like. I'm trying to show you there, coming across and turning. So really thick here and thick 
There's the, your axis turn where the flexors bulge. So there's the extensor egg form. And then we get into the details of the brachioradialis as that turns over. So we're, the ulna is underneath the radialis. It's pretty clear. Make sure you understand that. That's really important in understanding the form. That's what makes it, I think, a little bit more difficult. The flexors and the extensors can change. Brachioradialis, extensor carpi, radialis longus. And then we have the flexors here of the ulnaris on the edge, the greater edge, and through here. We would see the pronator teres, but it's pretty, pretty much buried. It's much deeper. But it'd be up by the olecranon, and we don't see much of it there. Maybe a little bit of bulkiness by the olecranon. So getting that feeling of the egg form, pretty, pretty simple idea for the drawing. It's not a very difficult pose. Put a V shape in through here, turning of the forms through here. Mostly the short tendon heads, and then they bulk out very quickly to the muscle. Really, three of them would be pronator teres a little bit, and through there the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, and then the palmaris longus through there. And then we get now the overlap, and through here we would get the little separation, little split. Moving in this direction, we get that bulkiness and then slight straight line downward, another curve, and then we start to think about the pollicis muscles, the abductor pollicis longus, and the extensor pollicis brevis. Remember, those muscles are starting from the ulna and also the interosseous material to give us a little bit of that thickness around right before the thumb coming down. Now the extensors on top we would see would brachioradialis extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis in the flexor digitorum which would give us those tendons all the way to the distal tips. But they're not all separated here. They're more grouped. So it gives us a more square shape around the wrist, upper wrist area. So turning that where those pollicis muscles meet and then they get buried into right where those veins start to run up and through there. End of the ulna, because the ulna is, disappears, it's overlapped by muscle and by bone of the, the extensors and the, the radialis. Not defining thoroughly, more, more clearly and cleanly what's going on here. There we go. Turning, turning, turning. Moving through. Now I'm probably defining more than even what's there, which is okay too. So we've got, I think, all our parts working together. I don't really see any coracobrachialis. I mean, the arm would, ha armpit would have to be exposed. Gives you a little bit of the head turn of the bicep, or a little bit more of the ligament. Excuse me, tendon would be in a little bit of shading in through there to give it a little bit of form. We could go into deeper shading, but I won't. I think we've just about got most of what we need here in our, our drawing. Again, what's important too is axis points of width where all our forms are grouped together, bicep and tricep. Where's the widest point in the drawing? They're never straight across or up and down. It's a rarity if they are. So we'll put that deltoid up on top of the biceps brachii and a little bit of the tricep that we see on the left, far left side. And then we'll just kind of clean up the drawing and make it a little bit clearer, and we'll get to the last one. Split a little bit here, the brachioradialis, where they split apart further. <clears throat> clean up 
clean up the olecranon above the ulna. A little bit of the brachialis actually, right in that area. Forgot to talk about that one. That would be on the opposite side of the brachioradialis. Pushing that back a little bit, turning this a little, not much left here for a study, for a living anatomy study. Just putting all the parts together, relating them together, and only drawing what we need to draw to make it clear for us. Notice we didn't draw each bone. That's more diagrammatic, and that's a great way to study, too. You need that to get to this point, to get even clear. Cleaning up the deltoid even further. Pectoral sliding underneath. And the bicep sliding underneath both of those together. The arm muscles, the bicep brachialis, uh, the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and the coracobrachialis will all be underneath the pectoral and also the deltoid, which will be, it's like the cap, the capping on top there. Just a little bit further, I think we got it. So there's the, our second pose. Let's go on now to one last. Pose. We've seen this pose before, but I'm going to put it in a different position. You can do that. You can turn these. Here we go. Thumbs up. Ready to move on to our last pose. We've seen this one before. Now we're going to turn it in a little different position. There we go. So first thing we want is gesture. Gesture, gesture. Nice arch, overarching feeling from the hand. You could start from the deltoid and work to the hand, or you can work from the hand out to the deltoid, it depends on the pose. It depends on the artist. There are many different ways to gesture where you want to start from. So here I'll start at the hand compositionally. And it's not a, a finished hand study, so we're just going to feel our way across these forms. A little bit of the rhythm of each finger to the carpal, to the wrist, right? underneath the thenar and then hypothenar and then we're going to gesture out and over arch through pull that gesture that curve over to a great place with change your gesture needs to change where joint changes so from the we see the ulna there and then we come down and over obviously that then it's kind of curved in like a little tube and that's where that gesture is going to change and then come on down further to the tricep and bicep area and onto the deltoid way down below here. So we come on down, use all this space. That's why I like to draw bigger too as well, just to show you the the physicality, feeling out now the the proportion. That's just where the arm starts to end at the bicep, that curvature. So I'm thinking gesture and form at the same time but still in the gesture stage and then we'll start to feel the deltoid over come over there we go and down through to get the underarm here so that'll open up to the deltoid biceps brachii coraco brachialis perhaps and the part of the the, uh, the lateral looks like the lateral tricep and through here turning around over from that that uh, the joint of the olecranon and through here and over in through to the end of the tricep and then feeling it down just feeling my way through the bicep area we know that's curving around we know there's the probably the Greatest sense of thickness or the axis of, uh, axis of thickness right in through here with the tricep, where its height is of the bicep, excuse me, here. And if you look on the other side where my arrow goes, where it starts to bisect the arm, that's where I'm just feeling the, where I think the th full thickness of the head of one of the triceps is going to be. So curving around the bicep brachii tendon 
will come up underneath. Where will that go to? Depends on the head. It looks like more of the medial head or the long, and that will go up to the coracoid process. There we go. Feeling that tricep up. Yeah, that's where it gets widest, right there. So I make a little stronger mark. That's what that little arrow helps me. I don't always draw the arrow. I draw it for education purposes, for show. But that's what's going on in the head. Is that where is that real true thickness? So now working from the ulna styloid process up and over, and then that really, see how that strong, how strong that bone is where the carpal area bones in and gets to the styloid process. That's the ulna, and we can see it in its curve, a curved position, kind of curved up and then down. And then a little bit now of the hypothenar part of the palm where the pinky is in the back side of the thenar area. There we are over. And now we're going to come, not really up so, up so much. Sometimes I'll, I'll extend my gesture, I'll over gesture, just for effect. And now we're coming through to the curvature, thickening, squaring of the wrist, the tendon areas of the flexors. Here we see more of the flexors than we do the extensors. Do you know why? We're underneath the arm. The bulky heads now of the muscles, where they have their thickest area. Remember, they're like puppet masters. They attach to either side of the epicondyles for the most part, and then move over di slightly diagonally to the upper or lower arm, depending where they're at, and they help control the fingers. There we go with the extensor there, extensor ulnaris. And now we're getting underneath to more flexors in through here quite a bit. And then we get a little bit of the brachy, brachioradialis in, in between the, the joint there. So we curve around the flexor, we'll make that more defined. Brachioradialis. Not quite there, right? No, nope, I'm still going to do this egg, egg over. The egg form of the flexors up and over to the edge, to the extensor there. And we're going to get more detailed now with the olecranon, the ulna part, or the epicondyle. There we go. So getting cleaner. So see how we've evolved now in the last, was it five minutes maybe? Our four or five minutes of our drawing. From a simple gesture, now we're getting form, and we're also talking through anatomy too as well. Have a drink there. Just feeling up the fingers a little further, not too much more detail. And kind of feel the metacarpals as they work around and the thumb just to put that on so we can judge things all together but not get any any much any more detail than what we need so finding where the palm hyperthenar muscles end and then we get to now the ulna part we're through here curving a little bit too and then we get to the end of the extensors and through here and the flexors also in where the roughly the shadow line is in through there and you can see how i feel that big egg form working around i always want to see it through there it's like a double egg if you could see it in the form where the hand starts to narrow, the arm starts to narrow down to the wrist. <clears throat> and we'll just start to put all this in shadow a little bit to make it easier. So you think of it as a rectangular box here, and then as we move around the shadow to a little bit more of a box and then an egg form within the box. Just to show you where that shadow is. It's that simple. So once you start to 
have drawn enough boxes and cylinders and egg forms, you can start to see it simply arrive onto the forms of the figure, whether they're volumetric or they're more anatomical volumetric. They're generally both. So coming through here, feeling where those extensors are the fullest, and you're going to see some inside form. See that little contouring I'm making? That's the inside of what looks like to be the perhaps the palmaris longus in through there in its location. So where you get more tendon slightly. You can see just a little bit of tendon, but you can also see the curve, the contouring of the curve of the skin even more strongly. Just filling out these contours a little bit further. And then there's that sub subform through there. So the very far side of that contour line are the flexor carpi radialis and inside are the palmaris longus and so on until we get past the shadow a little bit and then we get a little bit more of the extensor carpi ulnaris The greatest thing to remember is all this makes an egg form. Do you know where the egg is going in space? Its length, how it's lit, then you've got it. And you can start to separate and tease out the muscle forms per your needs. So we've got the ulna here. And then we can start to feel how the tricep is going to connect to that ulna, the epicondyle. And we'll start to just bathe that in a little shadow to help us through. It can get complex. Keep it simple. So now I'm just drawing the light form there in, in the drawing. Tendon of the bicep brachii. Okay, curls, turns way over. So that's the tendon. So it, it's a little subform in there, a little bit of brachioradialis there, or brachialis. And we have, that's the brachi brachialis right in through there. Then we have the biceps brachii in sub right in through there, in between there. It's really subtle. You want to make sure you start to see that with your eye. That's why studying anatomy is so important. You start to see the sub subtext subtleties that you need in order to to make your contours and your subcontours right inside your contour really work for you and kind of seeing and come together <clears throat> putting that little strong mark of uh, value on that line where the bicep overlaps the deltoid so the deltoid is wrapping on top but in this case since we're looking at underneath the arm the bicep would overlap. And now the deltoid is sitting on top, and we want to feel that curvature downward, getting that medial, excuse me, anterior part of the of the deltoid where it attaches to more of the clavicle area. Moving moving to the lateral, and then it's going to curve and separate a little bit right in through there. You can see, you can feel the striations. And you can see them in the in the reference photo. <clears throat> Moving over. Now we get an undercut here of that bicep as it separates from the deltoid very strongly. And it's going to be moving down into its tendinous connections, the coracoid brachialis, and in and in the longer head of the intertubicular sulcus up to the top of the glenoid cavity. The very top of it top of the humeral ball, it comes on top of the humerus ball. So that, that intertubicular sulcus that's split between the greater, to, greater and lesser tubercle, it's like a little canal for that tendon to go through. So we're starting to feel those tendons. 
in through here and now we need the outer part of the deltoid as it turns here and back into the underarm and overneath. And that part will go down to the deltoid tuberosity. So that's the shadow line there and then we get the outer boundary soon here through here. Bathe all that in shadow. And fill that deltoid in now. Very strongly. And we're going to really be, take care to demonstrate the the tendons of the muscle and then we'll come up and we'll start to separate this line starts to separate the biceps brachii from the tricep right in through there and we're all there in shadow through here now there's more shadow to come but that's the bicep brachii here and coming on around and over and then back over it's the underneath head and back to where it's going to attach and then brachial the brachialis a little bit right in through this area. Right in through here is the brachialis. Remember that brachialis sits underneath the biceps brachia. It can get a little confusing until you start to draw it quite a bit and you're like, okay, I see that now. So we get the ending of the, sh the shadow here, the side head of the biceps brachii quite nicely so we could put all this now in sh complete shadow. You can do that before and then separate but I'm doing it a, a little bit after so we can focus on the anatomy. So we'll curve that around that deep pocket of the end of the bicep. It's slightly flexed here. It's kind of arching and moving a little bit. And all this is wanting to turn over, turn over, turn over, like so. We'll just keep turning all that over. Kind of sausagey in that sense. And it gets a little curved and then it gets straighter as it comes down, getting closer to the tendon. And through here, that shadow kind of turns back into the tendon. So let's clean out this area. We have to separate the tricep from the tendons of the bicep. So now we're starting to separate that out further. So this is all tricep over here. There's the head of the tricep. And that greatest area of crest height right through there. And it will come down and inside there, right in through. Of course, we know that that's going to connect to the back of the humerus underneath the ball. So that's separated. Now we're going to separate further the bicep from the tricep. A little bit stronger, darker, but slightly softer edged quality between the two of them then it gets real soft in through here but that's the separation the greater separation between the two from this interesting underarm pull pulling or, or encouraging one to come over kind of view in a way so we're now we're getting a little bit more of the flexors over here in the tendon of the bicep brachialis in the brachialis area. So I'm going to curve this around where the bicep ends, the brachialis sits underneath, and the tricep goes to tendon into the olecranon area, in this case the medial head over by the ulna. 
and you can see it just a little bit. Let's see if I pick it up here. There it is. See where it's a little lighter and a little darker? Right in through the, roughly this area. That's where the, the tricep ligament is. And underneath is a little shadow as it turns up underneath and gets a little more of a pocket where the epicondyle is underneath there. <clears throat> it's a little contour line to help us out. You can use shadow tone, soft tone. You can use contour line. You can use a little both. I prefer a little both. So we're starting to see it come together now. And we'll put this bicep more in shadow here. It's really bulky there and it gets a little flatter through there and then it curls around to that tendon right underneath and through there and then we can get more contour. And that little tone there is important because that's a secondary bicep head as we move across. That's where the split of the bicep is, right through that, that area. So now we can take a darker pencil and emphasize little joints or dark areas disappearance. We have that flexor now coming in front of the ulna. And then this little pivotal area where the brachy, biceps brachialis in, brachii, uh, brachii in and the brachialis is underneath it. And through here, of course, we could go on for a long time rendering this. We could put the fingers on, but we've got all the parts we need here. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit, emphasize a few things further. Is that you're drawing all these bumps and grooves and these edges, and that's one thing. Um, if you didn't know what they were, it would be tough to make sure that they fit in the right place because it can get really complex looking at all these subforms. So you have to be careful. If you don't know where you're drawing, if you can't quite name it, you don't even have to name it anymore, but if you don't really can visualize it, you have to be careful. Um, and you'll, you'll know, you've seen a lot of, take the back for instance, a lot of really bad back views because they're not sure what they're really drawing. And that's why we have to open up anatomy for us to draw from. Nice strong crease between the bicep head and the deltoid and then the bicep tendon coming down on in and disappearing into the coracoid process as well as the top of the glenoid cavity through the intertubular sulcus, those two tendons. And then we have the tricep tendon coming over. So we get some good sub subtle separation between the bicep and tricep in through here. Very important to see that. Just a little bit. I'll push it a little bit further bicep to tricep so we can make it a little bit cleaner. Not a whole lot left, just cleaning it up, a little bit cur more curved, a little bit topping out the crest of the extensor carpi ulnaris, and then this is the flexor carpi underneath the radialis over there. So I think we've got just about all that we need. What else can we do here? 